Welcome to the LearnerPrivacy.org podcast episode four. My name is Charles Severance and I'm your host for the podcast. This podcast is about GDPR, the European Privacy Law, and I'm going to have to do at least two podcasts about this. This first podcast is going to be sort of critical, historical perspective, where things went wrong, uh, kind of a clickbait in it, if you were. But but there's a lot of good in it as well, and so I'm going to have end up two podcasts. One is kind of this critical take, and then we'll do uh, just a more of a straight up understanding of what GDPR is and what it intends to be, and if it were applied well, uh, how how great it would actually be. So GDPR is the General Data Privacy Regulation. It became e- EU European Union law in 2016 and went into effect 2018. It was preceded by the International Safe Harbor Privacy and later Privacy Shield. That was kind of 2000 and and adjusted in 2016. And then the EU Data Protection Directive, which is 1995, which is a very, very long time ago. And that's actually where we're going to start. But if you think about it, in 1995, most personal records were still kind of on paper or in mainframe computers. The internet, the web, really only became popular in 1994. And it kind of was focused on what the government was supposed to think about privacy with respect to its citizens. So, so but they're good principles. Uh, notice, subjects should know when their data is being collected, why they're being collected, what's the purpose. They should be asked if it's okay. You ought to take that collected data and protect it. Just don't sort of lose it. Don't let it get out into the wild. Um, if you've got data collected on you, you should be informed. You should dis- they should disclose that they're, they're pulling this data. People should be able to see what kind of data they have and see if it's even inaccurate. I mean, this is, this is sort of like a set of human rights about privacy with respect to their government. But these were great concepts, but they weren't really particularly binding. Uh, the United States was part of this uh, discussion And uh, they they, they did apply these principles to some degree to government-held data on individuals. But in 1995, there was no concept of the cloud. There were no cloud vendors. I mean, the Internet was really very young in 1995. And so there's a lot of really good ideas in this 1995 uh, directive, but it really doesn't apply to our current time. So as the cloud came out, you know, as the Internet really became a lot... uh, more significant around 2000, there was a big problem of sort of the clash between the US, United States view of sort of what software and hardware and cloud vendors were supposed to do and the European Union's sort of expectation of privacy. They're like, the, the privacy should apply here. And so they, the EU came up with some principles mostly about what it meant when U.S. companies would sort of begin to serve European customers. It wasn't particularly about learning data. I mean, we're talking about 2000, year 2000. Gmail didn't even exist until 2004. So this inter- safe harbor came out pretty early on, and it really anticipated the emergence of things like Google and Twitter and Facebook. And so it, it, it was there before they showed up. But then when they did show up, these world-scale vendors, they, they looked at this as like, you know, we're just having our way and doing whatever we want in the United States, and no one seems to care. We're having a good time sharing a lot of cat pictures. And here we come into this culture, this European culture, that's thinking about privacy. And so there was kind of like a clash of the titans. Actually, it wasn't really a clash of the titans. It was the clash of the titans stomping on the European Union. Google, Twitter, and Facebook just sued the heck out of them. And, and it, to the point where this whole safe harbor thing was turn, overturned, in 2015, when that fell apart, they came up with a replacement which was called Privacy Shield. And I think the idea was to bring the U.S. State Department, so the European Union was dealing with the government, the United States government, State Department in particular, and they kind of negotiated the deal that said, here's how U.S. companies are supposed to behave, and it got twisted and changed. And I was researching during this time, and I found a bunch of web pages about it, but it was pretty weak, and I found that if you do like a history Internet Archive, these pages would change from time to time, and the legal documents would say the actual law is in this web page, and then that web page just got edited. And so it was, I would say that the companies 
kind of ran roughshod over Privacy Shield. In a way, I think Europe was between the time that uh, the previous thing was overturned and GDPR, they thought GDPR will come out and this is Privacy Shield's just a kind of thing that we're going to do for a while. But it was pretty leaky. I mean, it really was, you know, in 2016, it was pretty leaky. And so if we look at sort of a European culture that sort of had a pretty good cultural commitment to privacy in general, um, 20 years later in 2015, I, I went to visit a Spanish university and I asked them, how do you deal with the fact that one of your schools is just using a U.S. learning management system? And they showed me. And you go to the system, and the first time you log in, when you're uh, first admitted to the university, there's a pop-up. And the pop-up says, well, we are using a U.S. company, and all your data is stored in the U.S., and you have no choice, but if you say okay, then that means that this is fine with you. Because these Google, Twitter, and Facebook had just beaten the EU into submission, um, when you, EU was on defense all the time, the U.S. learning management system companies, even as late as 2016, could just like, you know, wave their hands, put up a pop-up, and pretend that, that the EU was pretty much the same as the U.S. The GDPR, in, which became law in 2016, in a sense, I think, was the EU's view of we're going to win this time. We're going to actually build a law. We're going to learn from all of our mistakes. And we're going to bake in all those kind of cultural privacies and norms that we have. And so there's, there's some really wonderful principles in it, like lawfulness, fairness, transparency, limitation of purpose. You can't just kind of pull data you don't need. And now we're talking not about governments, but about companies. Don't take any more than you need. Make sure it's accurate. Let people see it. Let people fix it. And interestingly, there really are echoes of the 1995 directives. Limit what, how long you keep it. Make sure that it's, you keep it confidential. And make sure that we can talk to you about the data. We can talk to them. So, so I think it was really designed to finally win in a legal sense against the U.S.-based world-scale companies like Google. Because they'd lost so much so often. And a cynical view of it was maybe this time they would lose to Google, Facebook, and Twitter, but at least they would make a bunch of money and it would hurt Google, Facebook, and Twitter financially. So instead of just overturning it, they would just get fined. And so the severe fine is up to 20 million euros or 4% of the worldwide company revenue. Or, and if it's a less severe offense, it could be 10 million euros or 2% of the company's revenue. And so it... It, really, you can kind of see this thing as aimed at companies with a lot of money. And if they really want to just say, bugger off, then they can just pay their 4% tax to operate in the EU. Although the document is a good document. So like art, Articles 5 through 7, you can read them online. Principles. Article 7, the right to be forgotten. Article 21, the right to object to kinds of processing like machine learning and artificial intelligence. The responsibility of the controller, which is the organization that's initially collecting and putting the data and storing the data. And the processor, which is sort of like a second party to this. It's not a difficult read. I mean, you can read the GDPR and it makes sense to you. And we'll, in an upcoming podcast, we're going to go through these points point by point. Um, the one point that I'll bring out in this sort of shorter upfront historical version is the concept of controller and processor. So the GDPR defines a data controller as the initial collector, like it's the phone company or Airbnb or the university that you're going to. This is the, 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 the entity that you're in a sense know that you're handing your data over. Now they may use Amazon or they may use something in the back or who knows what service or Google or something, some cloud service to do that. And those are more the data processors. And the data processors don't have quite the same responsibility because the, the end users can't go to the data processor. You can't go to Amazon and say, hey, Amazon, what data does Airbnb have about me? You actually have to go to Airbnb and say, and then, Am then Airbnb will log into their Amazon servers and give you that data. So in that case, the proper simple example is Airbnb is your data controller, and Amazon is the data processor. Now, the data processor has a responsibility to the controller so that the controller can do their job, but 
if, as long as they give them the database and the Airbnb can read their database, then it's then Amazon kind of has fulfilled most of its responsibilities, as long as it doesn't lose the data and keeps it secure, etc. Now, in my research for this, I found I really like the Zillow privacy policy. Now, Zillow is, I don't think, is international like Airbnb. And Google uh, the Zillow right to be forgotten. And you scroll to the bottom and there are these buttons like, you can be forgotten. Just click right here and we will forget you. Now, for me, what's, what's my reaction when I see that, that I now have control over the Zillow data and I have a button to get rid of it all. And my initial reaction was, don't press the button. I want Zillow to know something about me. I want Zillow to show me the things I want to see. I want Amazon to show me the things I want to see. So even if Amazon would give me a button to forget everything, I wouldn't push it. But if you don't give me the button, I'm like, well, what are you doing back there, right? So I think that in the long run, if we start thinking about this, this is a good thing. I mean, the right to be forgotten doesn't mean that people want to be forgotten. If they do, then we probably should forget them. But, okay, GDPR, controller and processor. Now, in teaching and learning, in learning management systems, it's a little kind of vague, right? Uh, what if a university, a university's clearly a controller, uh, what if they outsource to a US-based learning management system, cloud-hosted, and that US-based learning management system uses Amazon? Well, it's pretty clear that the university is a controller and Amazon is the processor. And what if there's an LTI tool that's also a US-based LTI tool? And that LTI tool also uses Amazon. Amazon is clearly in all of this picture that I just drew, the, the processor. But the question is, if this LTI tool says, hey, log in to my front door so I can send you email messages about sales items when sales happen, they actually are becoming more of a controller. And the extent to which the organization, the, the LMS or the learning tool really develops the relationship outside of the university, if it's simply doing the university's bidding and sticking to its knitting and doing its job at the behest of the university, then the LMS is more of a processor, which is the simpler of the roles. But if it starts to try to do lifelong learning, um, cradle to grave, you go to one university, another university, and you start to record the data, you just go to grade school, the university, to community college, and we're going to record all this data and we're going to figure out a learning profile, well, you just became a controller at that point. So it's, the, I think the one thing that GDPR has got us thinking about is this notion of be careful where, you, if you, there are sort of trip wires that all of a sudden give you a lot more responsibility as a learning system. Um, so Pearson, for example, would almost certainly not just be a processor, even though they wish they were, they would probably be a, a controller because they're creating a long-term relationship in terms of learning profile. Another sort of fun, ironic, clickbaity kind of thing is the concept of GDPR prosecution. I can't, you can't have one person sue for GDPR. The government has to sue. And so they decide which violations are worth pursuing, right? So there's crimes that happen all the time and they don't get prosecuted. Like, for example, if you give your credit card to a Nigerian prince and they swindle you out of some money, you can go to your local police department. They'll, they'll acknowledge that was a crime, but they're also not going to send a bunch of people to Nigeria to find the person and get your money back, right? And so it's not a question of whether there was a crime or not. It's a question of whether it's going to be investigated and prosecuted. And so if you think about GDPR, its whole purpose was to go after these big companies. Google, Facebook, all the things that the EU had failed to get control over. Things like learning management systems, they kind of just flow under the radar. And so even in the post-GDPR, learning management systems aren't the reason that GDPR was made. There's a GDPR enforcement tracker, and it's kind of funny. Go search for the word university. Go search for the word learning. Go search for the word learning management system. Go search for LMS. You'll find zero 
things about LMSs. You'll find zero things about Canvas, Blackboard, Sakai, or Moodle. Nothing. You will find one university got in trouble because a student protested and the university sort of doxed them in that the university released their private data and they got in a lot of trouble for that. But it wasn't even in a learning context, so even the one that I could find about universities. They also show you by, the, by country and England and Spain just kind of culturally seem to have a lot more violations than other countries. Then just take a look at kind of the issues that show up that, that, that merit investigation and prosecution and you'll find that somebody in a party store had a, a, t a CCTV camera pointed out in the front door and a, they could see cars going by on the film which is gathering more data than you need and there's a 500, 500 euro fine for that. I'm like, okay, all this LMS data is going to the United States and no one cares but we're going to like bust some dude in their little party store? Well, probably because the prosecutor got bad service at the party store and like, look, man, I'm the GDPR local prosecutor. You can either refund my money on this, you know, bad piece of pizza or I'm going to see that camera behind there. It's pointing on the street. You're going to get a $500 fine. So it's up to you, buddy. And so it just seems like it's almost a joke. The things that they prosecute for and just go through it. It's it's a, it's, I think it's a great law. I love reading it. But in its application, it, Google and those folks, they don't get hit by it. And it's early days, but it's, it's not, not all that great. So I, I just knew about one university. I won't mention their name or even their country. But they, they were doing some due diligence of GDPR, and they asked their LMS vendor if, if they, it was a U.S. LMS vendor, and they asked their U.S. LMS vendor, like, you got GDPR going on, you're, you're all set? And the vendor said, yeah, our lawyers say we're good. And the university said, great, that's enough for us. Let's, let's buy your product. There is, like, no auditor. There's nobody that hunts this down to decide this. If this university pretends that GDPR is not a problem, then it is not a problem, right? The key is, is the university is who has to decide to comply with the law. So if we look at the past, since 1995, right, the past 25 years of privacy efforts, you know, it is full of good intentions and it's full of great, I mean, the first document in 1995, I just love the words of it, right? But it couldn't be more leaky. There are schools and universities that actually care. And what they get to do is that universities who care can have a wonderful conversation. And so all the good news that we'll talk about is talking about how activist universities in countries like France or Germany or Ireland like, look at GDPR, it's like, this is the beginning of the conversation with our vendors, and we want this privacy. We don't have to be forced to cover it. We don't think of this as an annoyance. This is the beginning of a conversation. So I'm, I'm happy because I'm starting to see conversations in the circles that I play in and that are starting to say, like, let's just look at GDPR as, like, how about we just figure out how to make do a great job of this? Not just, like... What did our lawyers tell us the pop-up had to say? But instead, wait a sec, let's really, there's a lot of good here. And then the other thing that I think is optimistic in terms of the GDPR is to the extent that it influences the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. And I'm noticing in the circles that I'm cruising around in, I'm starting to see that LMS vendors are a little more afraid or respectful of the California Consumer Privacy Act than they are of GDPR. They just think that they can get away with some kind of a whitewashing of GDPR and then move on. Whereas the California Consumer Privacy Act, think about it, this battle between the European Union and the US giants, kind of Silicon Valley giants, you know that Europe is kind of far away from Silicon Valley and so the Silicon Valley just stomps on Europe. But California, knows about Silicon Valley. California understands the U.S. companies. California is a pretty progressive place and they're pretty close. And so I think that we're going to find in time 
that the California law will be far more effective ultimately, even though it's going to take so, and it, the California law definitely builds on GDPR from a philosophical point of view. And all the work in Europe really has laid a tremendous uh, groundwork for privacy going forward. And if you want and you use it wisely, it's a great law, but it just doesn't seem to be used, used wisely across the board and people aren't scared of it. So they don't really comply if they don't want to comply. So. So we're going to talk about this more, upcoming podcasts, both of GDPR, what it is, how it works, how it can be used well, and the California Consumer Privacy Act and how that is a yet better step in the right direction with, the, with more appropriate kind of teeth. So we'll see you then. Cheers. Thank you for watching this episode of the LearnerPrivacy.org podcast.